This episode is brought to you by Progressive. Progressive helps you compare direct auto rates from a variety of companies so you can find a great one, even if it's not with them. Quote today at Progressive.com to find a rate that works with your budget. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, October 29th, 1966, a conference is being held in Washington, D.C. to establish a new group. It is the National Organization for Women, N-O-W, NOW. Now had been dreamed up just earlier that summer, literally on the back of a napkin. We'll tell that story. Um, But by this moment in the fall, there are 300 chapter organizations around the country, though at this first convention, things are relatively small. Uh, Betty Friedan, one of the founders, wrote about that initial conference, and I'm quoting here. She said, We wasted no time on ceremonials or speeches, gave ourselves barely an hour for lunch and dinner. At times we got very tired and impatient, but there was always a sense that what we were deciding was not just for now, but for a century. So I think that sense that they had then was justified. Now would, of course, go on to become one of the biggest and most influential women's rights, civil rights organizations in the country. Let's go back, though, to that moment, fall 1966, the roots of now here as always, Nicole Hammer of Vanderbilt and Kelly Carter-Jackson of Wellesley. Hello there. Hi, Jody. Hey there. This is a really interesting moment, really interesting subject. We want to do this on its own rights. But one of the motivations for doing this story is that we were chatting with our researcher, Jacob Feldman, recently um, about the sweep of episodes we've done. And he pointed out that the one year that he thinks that we have not covered, very weirdly, is 1966, which I never would have guessed. You know, um, to, to be to be fair, like year since like 1940. Yes, or something the like year that, right? in the sort of last, you know, mostly 20th That's century right. modern. We've also not history. done 1108, right? Or, yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, 1966 which is wild. slipped through the cracks. Yeah. Totally <laughs> wild. Yeah, because we've done so many about like 68, right? Um, mm-hmm. But anyway, here we are in 66. What this means, listeners, is you're going to get a lot of 1966 right. content exactly. coming up because we are zeroed <laughs> you know, in. You know, we have to even up the score. That's the goal. That's right. that's, yes. No one knows if that's the goal of this podcast over time. Um, mm-hmm. But anyway, um, I will tell you, a conference where you barely give yourselves an hour for lunch or dinner you know, I understand they've had very important work to do, but <laughs> part of it is like, well, maybe, and, then, and then she immediately goes maybe on to write. Maybe that's why you're right, Exactly. She immediately I goes know. on to write. <laughs> we hardly took time to eat. We also became very tired and impatient. I'm like, did you connect the dots about that? But, maybe that's where now <laughs> came yes. from. They were like, right. we're set now. I want lunch now. Uh, right now. <laughs> so uh, the National Organization for Women, I will tell you, this group comes together. Maybe we should go to that moment about when they decide to form this group. It comes together at another meeting the third national conference of commissions on the status of women, which just from an acronistic standpoint is not great. I like that they went to now, um, <laughs> but why the need among this group of women to start a new organization in this moment, 1966? Part of it was that you had these commissions that were starting in the 1960s. So in 1961, John F. Kennedy starts the President's Commission on the Status of Women. Here you have the Third National Conference on Commissions on the Status of Women. You have this this sense that there are these convenings and nothing is really happening. Like people are talking, but it isn't translating into activism. And these women who are gathered in 1966 in this hotel room um, where Betty Friedan is going to come up with the acronym now, they're getting frustrated and they're getting inspired by the black civil rights movement. They're like, well, look, look you know, the activists um, fighting for black civil rights are not just sitting around holding commissions. They're out on the streets. They're doing things. They have lobbying organizations. We need something more like that if we are going to be able to implement any kind of change for women in the United States. Mm -hmm. And when it came to, I think, legislation, that's a key part of it. Because if you're thinking about, you know, the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, 66 feels primed to have something that puts 
gender on and sex on the table in ways that just had not been there before and really puts gender and sex at the forefront alongside race because it often is something that just got completely forgotten out of the conversation like the civil rights movement does not put women at the forefront like it should have in terms of their issues and their leadership. Although in the Civil Rights Act of 1964, right, women sort of like get a, a backdoor entryway yeah. into, into <laughs> Title VII, which um, not only prohibits discrimination in employment on the basis of race, but on the basis of sex. But what they found was because they didn't have any sort of lobbying group or group that can, can interact more forcefully on behalf of women to enact that legislation, they were like the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission isn't getting it done, but mm-hmm. we don't have people who can force the government to put some teeth behind this new legislation. Mm-hmm. So the it's, it's both a, a kind of inspiration in the air, but also like this very real win that they had gotten that they hadn't been able to put into effect. Hmm. Before we get into that, because I think there's a really interesting tension there about kind of working the system versus agitating from the outside, right? But um, I did mention the back of the napkin. I mean, I love this tidbit of this story. Um, that's actually how it comes together by all accounts. Betty Friedan writes the letters N-O-W on the back of a napkin. And then right there uh, in the summer of 66, this group of founding women decide to make this thing happen. There are 15 women there. And I think it's important to just pause on that moment for a, mo- a second because it's not just that they come up with a name at this meeting. But Catherine Conroy, who's one of the women who's there, puts a $5 bill on the table and she says, put your money down and sign your name. And that idea that this has to be backed up with resources, that this Mm -hmm. is a commitment more than just like saying, oh, we're on this commission, Mm. but actually we're going to be devoting ourselves to this cause feels really significant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So was it, I'm putting one $5 bill on the table and everyone is signing the $5 $5 bill? No. no. Everyone take out your wallet. Put your <laughs> money down. Your sign this That's thing. Right. Put your money where your put mouth is. Put some money on the put table. Well, That's right. Skin in the game. I love it. Skin yeah, in the game. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and $5 <laughs> was worth a lot more back then. You know. But I love that. I love that moment. Um, Nikki, you were sort of hinting at this interesting tension um, because now seems to have both a, a real instinct for kind of uh, cultural appeal, right? Um, and And you know, and even everything from like the simple branding to the kind of language that they use to the kind of people that they rope in, like it, it clearly is is sort of taking a cue, I think, from many areas from the civil rights movement of like, we need to have cachet and we need to be telling a simple, yeah. simple, forceful story. Um, but then to your point, it also kind of has this technocratic, like we need to start making sure the levers of government are working a little more in our favor. So where do you see it kind of landing in, in, in that balance? And obviously it's not a choice between those two, but it's, it, it's a balance. Well, Yeah, it's not a choice between those two. And I think that, you know, when I think of now, now, uh, (laughs) it does, it sometimes feels like it fell on that slightly more technocratic side, because it does become this professional organization. There are much more radical women's movements that are emerging uh, at this point. uh, And after this point. And there are some tensions that play out as you're trying to figure out, like, are we playing the politics game Mm -hmm. um, from the inside? In which case we need to be, there's a kind of respectability politics around things like gay women in the movement. Um, Mm -hmm. There's a tension around black women in the movement Mm -hmm. and whether now really speaks for them. And as Kelly was saying, you know, as you get these kind of like founders of now, there's 49 people. It includes people like Polly Murray, um, who is a black woman who is... I mean, actually, her sexuality is really interesting. She's gay and I sometimes identifies with men and with male pronouns um, in a way that, that makes her an interesting figure. But you know, people like it was, wasn't Betty Friedan sort of like, oh, I don't know how I feel about lesbians in the movement. Yeah, um, yeah. Although now yeah, ultimately intersectionality comes out. is not. It's not something that was put on the table or put front and center in a way that we would think of it today, for sure. I think that that's one of the major tensions within the women's movement as a whole is like, how do we put more emphasis on women that have been marginalized? So looking at women of color, looking at, you know, queer women and their issues are different than um, other women. And so how do we like make sure that this movement is inclusive Um, It's something that I think that they've managed to get together now, but in its inception, a lot of that was murky. (laughs) 
You're used to hearing my voice on the world, bringing you interviews from around the globe. And you hear me reporting environment and climate news. I'm Carolyn Beeler. And I'm Marco Werman. We're now with you hosting the world together. More global journalism with a fresh new sound. Listen to the world on your local public radio station and wherever you find your podcasts. And they were looking for sort of ways to work the system. So one of the big um, things that now does, it's the, it's the first to sue on behalf of airline flight attendants for sex discrimination. So using lawsuits as a mm-hmm. way of um, forcing open opportunities for women, um, working on the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment, which would have secured for women equal rights with men. It would have been a constitutional amendment, did really good for a while, then didn't do so well. Um, but that idea that you, you need these political structures or these political um, acts as opposed... In addition to like marching in the streets and things like that, but as opposed to like a much more radical vision um, Mm -hmm. of what sexuality and equality might be. Yeah. And in that sense, they do take a a page straight out of the civil rights movement, which is to use court cases and the law um, to sort of serve as the backbone to your organization. Though it is also the case that there is clearly a sort of compelling story being t- I mean it's no coincidence that Betty Friedan is the chosen as the first president she'd written the feminine mystique we did a story mm-hmm. about that and I mean so much of the power of that was just simply making women mm-hmm. feel heard giving them a narrative giving them something they could just sit in their rooms and read and feel like they're part of a bigger conversation and they're not alone mm-hmm. and so you know all of that kind of um, softer more sort of narrative side of things is really really powerful too including you know and I'm I don't know, maybe I'm just hung up on this, but like that that logo, that now logo, I mean, it feels so emblematic. It's still the logo that was designed in 1969 uh-huh. early on. I mean, it just feels like this organization, especially lo- compared to the other organizations it was sort of pushing against, had a sense of the power of media, narrative, storytelling, all of those things, in addition to all of the sort of legal fights it was fighting. And that uh-huh. logo was designed by Ivy Bottini, who is openly lesbian. And I do think that that now gets criticized, yeah. understandably, for some of the limits of its activism. Um, but in the late 1960s and the early 1970s, it was still pretty radical um, to have openly gay women. It was still pretty radical to mm-hmm. even advocate for women being truly equal to men, because that wasn't something that was written into the laws of the United States. Um, and the idea that Women should have autonomy within marriage. The idea that women should have access to their own money. These were all ideas that seem very, they seem kind of pedestrian today. And that is in part a testament to some of the work that now um, and other um, organizations were able to achieve. Yeah. And access to their own health care, which is huge. I mean, you know, to to underscore how radical in some ways this was, I mean, you know, a lot of people who were involved in the organization were fearful of just signing their names to some of the initial yeah. documents because they had government jobs or they had other, you know, and so um, it just shows you how much it was really pushing things forward. And they were able to use activism to to grow awareness of the organization and grow the size of the organization because now is going to become a mass membership organization. And part of the reason they are able to do that is in 1970, they hold um, the Women's Strike for Equality. It's these, this nationwide demonstration for women's rights. And that's not just about marking the 50th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. It's not just about arguing for women's rights. But it is, it is again, it, it is a masterful kind of activism that calls attention to the organization. And once women look out and they see all of these women on the streets who are who are fighting for women's rights, they join now as well. And that helps mm-hmm. to make now this premier organization and really does swell its membership roles. I think it's its membership rose like 50% in just a few weeks after yeah. the um, the strike. Yeah, like 300 charters, right? Yeah. 300 uh, chartered memberships within a very, very fast amount of time. And we point out, I think rightly so, so many of the blind spots of second wave feminism in the sort of late 60s into the early 70s. But, you know, now by 1971, so, you know, five, six years into the movement, not nothing, but not a ton of time, they are passing a resolution that declares that a woman's right to her own person includes the right to define and express her own sexuality and to choose her own lifestyle and really taking a stance for gay and lesbian members of of the movement. And so, you know, I think that there is... um, there is something there about this organization pretty quickly hearing some of the criticism and advancing. Mm-hmm. Um, and 
you know, I don't know if you have thoughts as we wrap up about kind of now, <laughs> now, now, uh, <laughs> and how we have moved past second wave feminism. And I think we sort of see that moment. A lot of people maybe look back at that moment and see more blind spots than anything else. Uh, and I'm curious kind of what you think about its place, because it is still very active, currently has about 550 chapters. I just don't know how you see how it fits into the modern feminist movement. I mean, when I go, when you go to the website right now, like the first thing on their uh, uh, cover page is sort of like now fighting for racial inequality. And then underneath that, it's now's campaign for the LGBTQIA community. I mean, there's and then there's a whole nother section on, you know, voting. It's it's clear today, like what their mandate is, what their issues are, who their, you know, who their main um, audience is. And I think that that was not necessarily there, the genesis, but it definitely is now. Like, they cannot operate or function without putting these issues at the forefront. Um, and I, I think that that is how I've seen major changes. Absolutely. You see that in in other sort of historical um, institutions associated with liberalism, like labor unions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And in the case of now... It it's it's such an interesting time to be talking about them because women are losing rights in the United States that this first mm -hmm. generation of now founders had fought for, particularly reproductive rights and access to health care. Mm -hmm. And it's important that this organization that's been around for a long time has been able to adapt and to expand its vision of women and women's rights and politics in a way that allows it to continue to be a player at a time when you need organizations that are fighting for basic rights for women um, because those rights are under attack. So I, I think that it's what we're, we've seen in the evolution of now has kept it relevant um, at a time when it couldn't be more important. Right, right. Mm -hmm. um, well, we will leave it on that note. And there it is, 1966. We did an episode. Jacob, update the spreadsheet. Nicely done. <laughs> uh, and we will circle back to 1966, as promised, um, at some point. But We'll get 1108 on there. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, can you name a single thing that happened in 1108? <laughs> can I name a single thing that happened in the 12th century? <laughs> Of the challenge. <laughs> King Sigurd the first sailed from England on the Norwegian Crusade. To Palestine. Uh, that's another fun. Nicole Hammer, thanks to you as always. Thank you, Jody. And Kelly Carter Jackson, thanks to you. My pleasure. Support for this day in esoteric political history comes from Odoo. If you feel like you're wasting time and money with your current business software or just want to know what you could be missing, then you'll need to join the millions of others who have switched to Odoo. Odoo is the affordable all-in-one management software with a library of fully integrated business applications that help you get more done in less time for a fraction of the price. To learn more, visit odoo.com slash this day. That's O-D-O-O -O dot com slash this day. Odoo, modern management made simple. Radiotopia. Radiotopia.